Mona, Stefan, and Dorothe, it's our pleasure to have you today. We look forward to learning more about your work in the Caribbean. The floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Mona, for this introduction. I have the pleasure to start the round, although I'm not the one that contributed most to this product. So my name is Dorothy Spulder, you mentioned it, and uh, I'm part of uh, Airwalk Sundek, uh, which has been, together with others, developing the first compendium uh, almost 15 years ago. So it's a story of 15 years plus, actually. Um, I mentioned it, I'm, oh, what can you see? We can see your screen with, with, with your picture. Oh, me, oh, yeah, now we are. So I mentioned I'm part of AIRWAG. AIRWAG is a, a research institute focusing on aqu aquatic science and technology from the ETH domain in Switzerland. And we actually have many, many different departments. We at Sundeg are the only department which focusing specifically on sanitation, water and solid waste for development. So how, how, how we do that? We do, of course, a lot of uh, research to inform and support policymaking and so on. But we do also engage a lot, a lot in capacity development uh, and in advocacy. And I think that's the compendium came up out of kind of this branch of our work. Um, so what is the compendium of sanitation systems and technologies? It's a book. It's a book that you can hold in your hands. Uh, it's not too large, so it's quite uh, lightweight. It's very concise, but it gives a very comprehensive overview on currently uh, established technologies for sanitation system. So it's compact, it's easily understandable. It refers to more complicated information in references and all descriptions have been peer reviewed by several experts and accepted. And Last but not least, um, because it has been some sort of a success, it has been translated into more than 10 uh, languages today. Um, so one contribution, I think, of this compendium, and of course, it's, it was not only AIRWAG alone, was to kind of give a more structured definition of what is the sanitation system if it's not sewer based by introducing the sanitation value chain of five functional group from the user interface, the on-site storage and treatment, the convenience treatment, use and disposal. And this definition actually allowed to kind of give people a more easy understanding on what kind of technologies actually are out there and how can we put them together. So the compendium is organized with a number of system templates, a system template being a suite and list of technologies that together combined form the certain type of systems, being it wet, on-site, off-site, and so on. And then for each technology, there is a two-page max um, fact sheet describing what this technology is about and what are the main design considerations. So that's just an example of how such a system template looks like. It allows people actually to have an um, overview on, on a first step. Do I want to have a wet system? Now, if I want to have such a wet system, what are the different technologies that might be suitable in my context? Then I mentioned this uh, technology information sheet. I think one important element is also the very simple drawing that people can capture in one view uh, what this technology is about. Um, we also introduced a number of definitions of products. Of course, it's a, it's a very strong simplification of what you will find in reality, but by kind of categorizing what kind of products we, ha we have that can go in and out of the technologies, this allows to assess for um, any person if two technologies are somehow compatible in the sanitation value chain. Um, I mentioned it, you have different languages, over 10 now. Uh, the most recent one is the Russian one, which we developed also for the emergency uh, context. And I mentioned it, so th there is th different contextualization. The most recent ones is the Compendium of Sanitation Technology specifically for um, emergencies. And the other one is the Guide to Sanitation Resource Recovery Products and Technologies. That's actually an amendum that kind of gives a spotlight on technologies available specifically for resource recovery. Um, 
So of course, the compendium um, has been contextualized. So the added value of the emergency sanitation compendium is that it's also available online. So it becomes more flexible. And a more recent uh, development is SunnyJoyce, which is a full online decision support tool, which actually also includes recent technology innovations. But having said that, that's very, um, these are all kind of compatible or Com um, uh, complementary products, the main added value of the compendium is really its simplic uh, simplicity. Um, what is an addition uh, of the of the Sunny Joints tool is that you can kind of compare different systems for different decision support uh, criteria. So um, having said that, well, why do we need to have a contextualization of the compendium? I think the advantage of the main kind of document is really that it has been peer reviewed and that uh, the, the, the definitions on technologies, um, they are very well evidence-based and they're not kind of exploratory. Um, and the, the most simple way to contextualize that is to Translated, obviously, what has been done 10, 10 times, but there is actually also a, a reason why it could be further contextualized, and I think the example we're going to see today is, is, is showing that very clearly. So one element, of course, is the specific technologies and systems that might be uh, available in a given context or region, and also to include specific sector knowledge, not only the technology knowledge that can help um, uh, practitioners uh, using this tool in practice. And with this, I think I directly hand over to Stefan. One second. Thank you very much, Dorothy. And here we are. What a fantastic audience. And I'm sending you greetings from Cochabamba. Un saludo desde Bolivia a todos. Um, we are gearing up for the um, Latino Sound Conference at uh, quarter past five in the morning. So if everyone from the Caribbean has done the effort to join us from there, I'm all with you uh, in the same uh, time zone. And yeah, what a fantastic starting point maybe to dive further into that uh, new companion and how we can learn or how we can increase um, the uh, learning um, through that process and this is the time for me to share the screen and I hope you can see it here we are um, um, my my task is to flip through the book um, around this compendium if you haven't uh, done it already maybe there's some um, additional points or thoughts from my side um, I will share my key learnings and that's it for that task I was uh, working for the German base, as uh, Michaela said, uh, Consultancy Aqua Waste International Germany, a fantastic team out of Hannover. So not to let you wait any further, I'm starting with the key learnings. And as we flip through the slides, maybe there are some elements. The first and, and biggest one uh, would be that we finally have been able to make container-based sanitation part of the compendium because I personally think that for fast growing urban areas, um, the current practice of digging up pit latrines um, is expensive, not convenient. So the positive side, which I had got convinced on through many publications and interventions um, over the past decades, and also the last FSM conference of the second last in Cape Town, which as a city is already doing that, um, convenience, safety of service, resource recovery much easier and has the lowest carbon footprint. Um, the second big learning is the element of carbonization and biochar application. So we introduced the technology of carbonization. Actually, we adapted it from the resource recovery compendium, which uh, Dorothee just introduced, was published in 2021. Great collaboration with the Swedish Agricultural University there and the biochar application, which is one of the new products. Um, fecal sludge, for all of us to remind, is a huge resource, highly needed for a process which is called pyrolysis-based carbon capture and storage, which is part of the global framework on how we can reduce 
uh, CO2 not only by emitting less, but taking out what's already in the atmosphere. Um, the contextualization through the policy framework, planning, groundwater perspective, so that one has become kind of a guide to implement regional policy into practice, which might be something to replicate elsewhere. <clears throat> and sorry, as we are gearing up for FSM 7 in Abidjan in February next year, maybe there's room for discussing with other partners, either to replicate it countrywide. We have uh, visitors from Nigeria in the room and other countries. So that is a whole uh, half continent itself with 100 million inhabitants, or even with the African Sanitation Policy Guide to have an overall element. Look forward to discuss things like that. And something which I didn't write down, contextualization to me is a process. So we have reached out in a participatory um, process before developing the different elements to a constituency of about 300 professionals, 250 through stakeholder um, kickoff meetings, online meetings. Obviously, there's many more people and a much larger number we have missed. But the point of adapting and really turning into practice uh, a publication is based on whether people are involved in the process, are knowing about what's coming up, and are then eager to take up the new publication. So the process, to me, was the most important thing, which will I will write down further after we have finished this one. Okay, now let's flip through the book. The key drivers of climate change with this fantastic graphic of all the hurricanes over the past 100 years in the Caribbean obviously let the um, region, the islands, and also some of the mainland uh, to put climate change as a framework um, for a, a regional uh, action plan for strategic um, adaptation to the impacts of climate change. We all are aware about a number of elements and, and tools like um, the space of uh, safe operation, the safe operating space, and that specifically um, sanitation related um, nutrient part, you can see it down there, phosphorus and N, the biogeochemical flows. We are far beyond a sustainable um, management of these resources. And that has been the driver. Now, currently we, we feel in the trend that fuel prices are going up everywhere, fertilizer, food is going up, CO2 emissions as well. So once again, never waste a catastrophe, but maybe let's use that as for fast tracking the recovery of energy, nutrients, water, and carbon, which is our resource from food and digestion. So as um, Dorothy mentioned this book, and we're looking through sanitation systems and the products, we have introduced a number of new products. On the top right, you can see that from the uh, recovery compendium, we have introduced um, something which can be a mix of um, black water and gray water, which then is called wastewater. So a few of things are new. The systematic has been followed. We have updated new technologies. We have reduced the number of systems from nine to six because we took the perspective of urban utilities. In the introduction, you can see that the Caribbean Water Wastewater Utility, no association, and the Caribbean Water and Sewerage Association are co-conveners of this compendium. We want it to be applied in practice. And that's why we did not repeat a number of pit latrine technologies, which are already documented out there but what is really new and what matters most in the opinion of the authors is for densely urban areas not to replicate pit latrines, but introduce um, the container-based sanitation system. So now the next slide doesn't want to come up. We have reduced the number of technologies due to that change I just explained from 48 technology, from more than 50 technologies to 48. But all of those papers have been adapted, uh, reframed, and are really uh, the outcome of the peer review process. 
a quick flip through these new parts three and part four. The part three is really the um, concentration of contextualization based on the fact that we put the regional strategic action plan to, for the adaptation to climate change first. And then we look at different, what, what, are, what are the different aspects of that regional strategic action plan. It starts with all these axes in the beginning and the five pillars of X1 to X5, which are represented in this beautiful drawing. We also adapted from the regional action plan. So we are going through every of those elements of that drawing in the document. The other part is case studies. Now, Airwalk Chris Lutie was a little bit hesitant to let us use case studies because they are fast outdated. So we took great care in putting up the criteria. It must be a real case. It must be visible and approachable uh, in the world. So we asked stakeholders for their contributions. And then we got a number of beautiful case studies. The important part in those case studies is that we do apply the same rules to the, that game, but I'm coming to that a little later. I already gave you all those explanations. So here we are with the, with the regional uh, plan. We also make sure that all the different contexts which we do have are replicated. So the foundation of stakeholder and, um, um, engagement, the importance of a number of uh, current policies, you can find all that including capacity building efforts, which are using that book now and a new outreach of the uh, global sanitation uh, training based in Delft, Netherlands, a new partner in Uruguay, they're making use of that. Now, the case studies for different standard application, even one which is non-domestic, but you will find a slaughterhouse, often the most ugly spot in the city. So if we want to turn a nightmare into a dream, this is what we need to start with. So those cases are really following the same logic. And as you can see, the framework, the principle of the systematic of a sanitation system is replicated in practice for everyone to see a little bit, okay, how could I use maybe that tool for my own purpose? All right, so I was speaking already a little bit about the key learnings. There's a lot of referencing, further reading. We didn't find space for that. Much more resources, updated ones from different activities. We hope we haven't left anyone out. So key learnings here again. Thank you very much. I'm stopping here. Look forward to an engaging discussion with all of you and handing over to Mona to give us a little deep dive into one of the cases. Here you go, Mona, over to you. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you, everyone who spoke before me. It's a great pleasure to be here. And it's such a fantastic opportunity that the container-based sanitation solutions are now part even with a case study and it's my pleasure to present our example so i will share my screen um let me see that we have that at hand perfect so i hope everyone sees it otherwise give me a sign um so again thanks everyone my name is mona meetup i'm the founder and director of mosan mosan is a container-based climate positive circular sanitation solution and um yeah let me take you through it how we work what does it mean that we are container based and we are climate positive and um yeah but I, of course want to start to say that i'm representing here a diverse team that is growing. We have a lot of local Guatemalan experts as part of our team, but also international advisors and team members. And that's how we are approaching uh, those diverse challenges that we are that we are facing in sanitation specifically in Guatemala. Guatemala is quite an interesting place to work. We have been now in Guatemala since 2018. Guatem Oops. I think my presentation probably up. Do you still see it? I hope there it is. Guatemala top is actually in the top five in the world of countries affected by hurricanes, flooding, and climate change related disasters. So it's, yeah, people in, in especially in the rural areas usually face many uh, threats at, at the same time, which makes it quite a difficult place to implement sanitation, conventional sanitation solutions. 
we got to know Guatemala in 2018 through different connections, through a visit from my side. And I got the opportunity to work in this beautiful indigenous community at Lake Atitlan. Lake Atitlan is one of the most important lakes in Guatemala. It's extremely threatened by all the inflow of wastewater. There's an, an estimate from local authorities that say 500 liters of wastewater enters this lake per second. There's around um, 18 communities around. Uh, and none has a fully functioning sanitation system. You can also see the infrastructure is quite specific. We have uh, three volcanoes around the lake. Uh, we are facing, there's a lot of stone grounds. It's hard to dig. It's hard to install conventional systems. Also the distribution of water is a challenge. So you see already the challenges are maybe similar as we find them in other places around the world, but quite specific and uh, perfect to, to, to consider a container-based sanitation solution. Digging is difficult, water is scarce, or if it's there, it's not properly distributed. We have a rain season, we have a dry season, and the infrastructure makes it quite hard yeah, to, to install drainage systems and, and to manage them. And on top of it the lake is it there's quite an urgent need for solutions so many solutions are in the planning but they have like timelines of like 10 year projects where they are looking of like if there could ever be a drainage system that is centralized for the lake but nothing is working uh properly right now and this is where we came in with our with our solution Mosan is, um, we often speak of even of an off-grid solution. And there I want to connect with the topic of like climate threats. So we, I mentioned already like water scarcity is an issue. We even sometimes have two days without electricity in those rural places. So we really had to look for like how to adapt our solution to this quite extreme scenario. But at the same time, even though we are in a rural area, it's urbanizing because of the infrastructure around those communities. They are not growing in size, they are growing denser and denser. So we are providing a literally an off-grid solution that works currently without electricity. We need very little water for some cleaning process, but the toilet itself works without water. And as the name says, container-based sanitation, the whole collection and transport system of excreta works um, based on, on containers. And um, I'll show that further. Here you see the five main pillars our solution is built on. We have education, um, we have the toilet, of course, which is the user interface for the families, for the users. We have the service, including all the collection and transport, our transformation module and the reuse. And there we will speak a bit more about the fertilizer, the biochar fertilizer that we are producing at this moment. Education is the first one we mentioned because for us, education is not just education in the conventional sense. Um, Kaela introduced me in the beginning that we apply a lot of participatory approaches, which are really at the heart of our values and our vision and mission as, as, a, as a, yeah, a design driven solution that we actually include the local population in the design implementation and also operation and maintenance of the solution. Our vision is that the, the, these container based sanitation systems that function per community, that they are actually driven and maintained by the community. So in the long term, we can more and more uh, yeah, reduce our intervention, but they are really uh, managed from the community and, and, and owned and, and uh, facilitated by the community, which is a franchising system that we will in the long term um, uh, implement. That means we use a lot of, you see, a few impressions, a lot of creative methodologies, how we integrate the community in, in decision making, in design decisions, but also, of course, as team members, as staff, uh, as strategic advisors um, in all different positions. I can't go super deep in that approach, but who is interested to learn more, um, I want to recommend our publication that we um, uh, released last year. Uh, with Springer, where we go much deeper in this participatory approach um, that we are applying. And I will just put the link uh, here in the chat. So to go on and show you a bit more of what we are doing, here's the Mosan container-based toilet. So it's quite a, a, a simple approach. We have, there's no ventilation, there's no electricity, um, there's, there's no chemicals that we use in the toilet. It's literally a separation into two containers. People cover feces with ash, uh, with so the sawdust. Ash actually doesn't work so well. We have tried that. So we use sawdust uh, in Guatemala as a cover material. Those two containers are removable, which we then collect 
collect. And there's different ways how we collect it. It really depends on the community, on the infrastructure, um, what means of collection are appropriate. In the first community where our service is running at the moment, we have two means, which is one is those um, collection points, how we call them, where families can go during opening hours, bring their containers, and our staff receives them during that time, provides fresh containers. So families go back, have a fresh container to use to put into the toilet. And then afterwards, we transport it to our centralized uh, community central transformation center. The other mean of transport at the moment is due to COVID uh, in 2020, we had to close those collection points. And we started visiting, literally going, sending collectors to people house, people's houses to get those containers. And for some areas of the community that are quite far, where we don't have those close by collection points, we still do door to door collection, which is something to keep in mind when, when sink considering container-based sanitation, that a huge part of the costs and time factor is that collection part of containers, and it needs to be considered for, for costs, for the logistics, uh, is the infrastructure at all um, feasible to do that. So at the moment, we do what you see on the left side, this manual transport of uh, the materials from the different points in the community to our central transformation center. We do work on a pickup trans transport system that we will implement in the next community. The community at the moment doesn't have any roads, so there is no access for pickup service. When the materials are, they are then brought to our transformation center. And this is quite an, an, an exciting journey that we have uh, uh, gone through. We started in 2018 with, and it's still quite low tech uh, for, for many good reasons, but we started with even more low tech pyrolysis uh, uh, reactors, literally built in the community with local welders, with local materials, with what we could find and, and what we knew we can repair, we can maintain. And it was fantastic to learn. So we started with pyrolysis for many different reasons. One is we had to have a tre treatment process that is uh, a space uh, effective. We couldn't we couldn't find large enough spaces in the community, for example, to do composting. So space was really one big factor. Another one was safety. We knew the system needs to be it needs to be run and operated on community scale. That means our staff has different educational backgrounds, so we can't rely on on high expert knowledge. So we needed a process that we can easily teach um, to community members. We needed one that is quite durable, it works without electricity, it can work off grid. So something that is really resilient. And we learned about pyrolysis. So we were like, this sounds fantastic. Within a few hours, you can under uh, um, the thermothermical process. So with high temperatures, we can sterilize the material and we can transform it. So many things done um, yeah, that we that uh, many things could be achieved that were quite important for this type of context and culture that we're in at the moment. Our transformation center is literally in the middle of the community. We have to the left a hotel, we have to the right, we have private houses. So emissions, smoke, smell, all of those things were really high on the list of like to consider and to keep in mind, because of course we need to have something that is accepted by the community that they are fine to have us as neighbors. So Parolis really provides all of those advantages for us. We have here in the picture, you can see um, a drying bed, still one of the small old ones and uh, uh, one reactor um, uh, unit, uh, you can say. Um, so we have to, one of the most important steps for pyrolysis is the drying. The toilet already provides the separation of feces and urine. Nevertheless, the feces are still too moist to start and, and paralyze them immediately. So we, we put them into those drying beds use the off heat, the heat from the last uh, pyrolysis batch to blow that hot air into the drying bed to dry it faster. And as we reach around 20% to 30% moisture content in the material, it's ideal to start the pyrolysis. This reactor unit that you see here next to Rudy on the picture, it can carbonize 24 kilograms of dry material in one hour, and we have a harvest of seven kilograms of biochar. This is really amazing for us because we've been working now for many years with very small reactors, using a lot of propane gas, and it was quite slow. And this new reactor that we have built throughout uh, the last year, 
uh, allows us to actually not use any electricity. We don't need, need propane gas, but we use dry coconut shells as a fuel. So you see here on the right image, on the lower one, that there is a feces mixed with wood chips. The wood chips and the sawdust is already a cover material that families apply in the toilet. Additionally, as we fill this feces wood chip mix in the, in the, in the reactor, we add on dry coconut shells. It's a waste product. We get it delivered from people who sell coconuts. We dry those in the sun and we use that as an additional fuel to 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 provide enough uh, uh, energy to run the pyrolysis process for for one hour feces by itself the calorific value is not high enough to just do it with feces at least not with this type of low-tech reactor that we are using here so we have to add an additional dry biomass that provides structure a little bit of airflow even though pyrolysis is very low on on oxygen that that creates the carbonization, but we do need some airflow to keep the heat and the flame going to, to, to maintain the process for one hour. So this is what we do since, since 2018, and it has evolved. We have built over four reactors over the four iterations with small changes, so probably more than four iterations if we count all the changes. And we are now at a point where we have a collaboration with the government. The government is financing now a much bigger system that we will actually even patent. And we are happy to hear if someone is interested to use our system, get in touch with us. We are not yet at the point that we can sell it. We are still trying and, and perfectionizing it um, throughout this year. So probably until yeah the first quarter of next year, we're still in this uh, uh, R&D of this technology, but we are very curious to hear if anyone is interested, we would be happy to talk. So what is really important for that process, I already mentioned it, is a, is a drying process. And that's why you see here in this, in this illustration on the left, the drying bit is actually the biggest part of the system. The reactor units, small here in the back, um, we already know that they're working. We have them in operation right now, but optimizing drying in a country with half a year of rain season is quite um, the challenge. So that's uh, the last part that we are innovating on in the technology part. So as you can guess, we get as a result, we get biochar. Biochar is, I won't even mention all the benefits it has. Um, I think it has become quite famous and people have heard that there's a lot of benefits for us. What is most interesting in the case of Guatemala, Guatemala is an um, agriculture-based country. More than 70% of the population work in agriculture. So reusing biochar as a fertilizer is, of course, the, the first priority. So since uh, August 21, we are facilitating an international research project uh, together with ETH, um, where we are further refining, enriching, and developing this biochar to become really an effective fertilizer for, uh, for agriculture. We have three trials going on at the moment with maize, with reforestation seedlings in the greenhouse, and with vegetable seedlings in the greenhouse. We already know from the first two, we started planting maize in, in May around, the reforestation seedlings in July, vegetable seedlings has just started this month. So from the first two, we already have some preliminary results. We know that biochar works best enriched with urine, and this is where we are working on a new technology, a process that's called alkaline dehydration. So we literally soak the biochar in urine and evaporate the liquid from the urine to get a biochar that has uh, this higher in, in nitrogen. And you see here some, some calculations on uh, what we estimate how much the biochar will, will be useful for some first results um, that we can share about this. So we're now talking about urine enriched biochar. It is quite strong to mention that. So everyone who has worked with urine knows that it was even in the beginning so strong in nitrogen that uh, we had trials uh, where the plants got burned. So it is even not like as much to put as much urine as possible, it does need to be very, very uh, carefully dosed to have uh, the right amount depending on your plant and the, and the, depending on the crop and the needs. And just some impressions on how that is going, the different trials. We have fantastic partners in Guatemala who are experts in agriculture. Um, they're called Vivamos Mejor and they have this research center called CEDRAC and there we can do trials in in a control setup, but also in the field with farmers just out of that um, research center. And um, 
just so you get some impressions how that works and um, I think there I'm coming to my end so we have enough time for Q&A we have um, yeah uh, I just want to mention the importance for us of being climate positive we mentioned already all the climate threat and uh, environmental disasters that a country like Guatemala is facing but also as a as a social uh, uh, enterprise, we look for like how in the long term, how can we create a, also a sustainable business model? So being climate positive opens the whole world of carbon credits also to us. And there's two ways how we can participate in carbon and emission trading. One is by replacing pit latrines and saving emissions from conventional solutions. And the other one is with through carbon storage in the soil. So there's two approaches to to saving carbon and to participate in emission trading. And that's quite an important, yeah, basically market for us to use to have an additional value stream um, that allows us to create a sustainable business model in the long run. And I think I will finish here and just we hear some more questions. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much to all the speakers. That was a very, very interesting breakdown of the compendium and some great, um, great examples that we've heard from Guatemala. Thank you so much for your time. I'm just going to, I've seen some comments about the compendium. Uh, we have one from Remy that says, I have made heavy use of the compendium. Great to see CBS as a whole chain service, not just a single technology in the chain. Fantastic comment, it's so true. Also Nicola supporting, saying as a side note, we use the compendium regularly and are eternally grateful for the publication. And one from Najib that says the education component is very powerful. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Um, so we have a few questions. Um, we have one from Peter who says, can we download these documents? Um, Oh no, you posted a link in the chat. Was that is that the link to the compendium? Um, that's just our publication. If someone wants to read more about Mosan, since I couldn't cover all the topics in detail. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then we have another question from Peter who says, in the case of South Sudan sanitation, that uh, in the case of South Sudan where sewers have not been introduced yet, which technology is advisable for our case? Um, does anyone feel comfortable addressing this question or maybe Peter, maybe Peter can write to one of you to talk about that separately. Does anyone know? Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm happy to maybe quickly um, give my um, initial feedback on, on that one. Um, yeah, thank you very much for your question. Um, you know, I believe, uh, Peter, that we have been looking, sorry, I'm trying to share my screen with these points. Here we go. So we have been sharing um, that principle of the different steps. And in a country like South Sudan, where there is no sewer already, you are in a brilliant situation to not replicate what is not sustainable. But um, the key part will be how to um, you know, go through a process which is down here uh, with your policymakers, with the administration uh, regulation, so that those who are providing the services, whether it's um, a franchise uh, character, whether it's individual companies or a public service offered by the community is operating under clear <clears throat> guidelines so that at the end, the end user, as a safe service. So often today we have global policies like the policymaker, 100% sanitation for all by 2030, great. And a few regional policies where we struggle is around that part because um, operators can be trained to use the new technologies, but to provide a safe operating space for that needs engagement. So. Peter, look out for partners, for organizations. Um, I can help um, thinking along to go through that process and then for each situation, pick from the menu of various technologies to make your sanitation work 
in the different parts of South Sudan according to local practice and uh, opportunities and so on. That was my quick attempt to go to that one. Um, Thank you. Reach out to any partner and, 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 and people who can uh, be with you in that process. Of course, it needs resources. It needs an operating space to go through that process. So I think there's where there's a will, there's a way for, for getting along in that direction. I'll stop here. Thank you, Stefan. We have another question from Najib. He asks, he, well, he says, efficient collection and transportation has been one of the critical barriers for CBS. It would be interesting to learn how you have dealt with logistical arrangements, timely collection, scheduling of transport logistics across the service area, safety aspects and associated costs. Um, Mona, would you like to tackle yeah, that? Yeah, of, of course, of course. So basically what I presented those, as everyone can guess, like going door to door is the most, the least efficient way to do that. So that for us was an emergency response due to COVID measures, lockdown, uh, that we also, we had also lockdown measures in the community. So the, those semi-central collection points is already our response to make it more efficient. And they are even, there's limitations to that because of course, if you have those semi-central collection points, first part of the of the collection depends on the family so they walk there when they have to get a new container so it's not on us to communicate to check we don't need a sensor in the toilet to measure when does it fill or anything like that it's literally the habits and the the usage from the family that defines when they go and and get a new container so that is excellent the limitation is that it's infrastructure investment for us to put up those points so the third optimization, which is a limitation in the first community, I mentioned that we will have those um, pickup truck services. So this is the ideal scenario based on our analysis is basically parking a pickup truck to during different times of the day in different sectors of the community. Families can go, thereby we cover the first part of the transport from the private house to the to the semi-central collection point. And then we don't have to make infrastructure investments in different parts and different sectors of the community, but we literally have like one or two of those prepared prepped pickup trucks and we can park them in different locations. And people, of course, there's a lot of habit. We have to inform people of the service hours, of the location. The pickup truck does need to provide some comfort that people can be in touch with our staff that is there to communicate. So it's not just a pickup truck parking for five minutes. Of course, it's a special pickup truck that has some roofing that we pull out during service time there. So, so I would say those are the three optimists, those the three areas from least effective from collecting containers where they are being filled at the household level to creating a habit of people to bring it as close to you as possible and if that collection point can be even mobile it's it's the ideal case based on our analysis and experience of course thank you very much thank you thank you oh we have an interesting comment from remy saying efficient collection and transportation as a critical barrier isn't really true, it's the essence of CBS. And this is a great added value to residents and authorities. It's of course very hard to achieve, um, but you know, it's, it's, a, it's a work in progress. Thank you for that comment, Remy. Um, we have a question from Sagar, sorry if I pronounced that wrong. Um, and he asked, uh, what is the capital and operational cost of the treatment setup? Think one of the ones directed yeah to. and now i was quickly distracted reading remy's com comment mm -hmm. um so i think the question is about the the cost so i can share one number that usually people are very interested in is so our ideal service size which is also important to keep in mind we're right now we're focusing on those urbanizing rural communities we're also not urbanizing but the most urbanizing ones are most interested right now in in having a container based system due to the infrastructure challenges and our ideal service size is somewhere between 500 i mean we can even the latest calculations show we can with this very low cost setup that we have right now machines build and operate in the community we can break even a service already with 200 families if all the value streams are in place of course that means the fertilizer are 
fertilizers are being sold, which they are not yet. So this is, of course, a, a speculation based on, on our market analysis, based on conversations that we have right now with different carbon trading uh, companies worldwide. So what prices we can achieve for that. So already with a service of 200, it looks promising to break even a small community service so that it, it finances itself. An ideal cost scenario is having 500 families participating and 300 to 500. And with 500, the cost per unit that uh, we have to operate per month would drop down to $20 to give a bit of an, 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 a sense of how, how much it costs us and um, yeah, how, we're, how we will manage it with the three value streams, which is the carbon credits, of course, which is actually just a small part. It will make 8% of the value streams. The biggest part will be from fertilizer sales, biochar, which will make 80%. And of course, the third one is families contributing with their monthly uh, service fee that they are paying for having the toilet and the service. Thank you, Mona. Um, Mona, I think there's a, quite a few questions directed to you. <laughs> So yeah, sure. we, have, we have some questions related to community acceptance, acceptance and community engagement. Uh, so I'm going to combine the question from Justina and Jackia, um, who asked, how was the community acceptance of the technology at the beginning? And what behavioral change processes did you undertake to see that all community members were able to use the toilets? Yeah. So behavior change is I would say like sometimes people ask us like what are the biggest challenges honestly from my point of view technology we always find a solution mm. we there's so much engineering expertise out there that usually we find technical solutions rather quick or in a short amount of time the behavior change is what is a long-term project and needs to have a good strategy, but also patience. When we came, of course, like we are working with an indigenous communities, like and everyone was suspicious. What is this? How does it work? And I will see my poop. Normally you don't see it. It drops in some pit latrine. So it starts with simple things up to more complex things of like what happens. Um, yeah, if we have guests and then there is five people in the house and then we need more containers. So there is just like personal issues up to like, um, yeah, like it, it changes a lot of people's behavior. So this is why we actually started using integrating people more and more in the process this is one of our strategies to take them on board to it's it's we call it participatory design which is great because it gives us better results of the design process we can make better decisions because people are part of it but it also increases the acceptancy like people are part of defining certain aspects we decide together in which sector for example now we're building a new community service we're defining in which sector are we starting so the community has to vote so no one is upset that we start in that in that part so to increase acceptance and openness for people to be part of this it's really important to have a very um yeah collaborative approach and that's yeah part of why we use this these participatory design approaches um, for, for two parts to get better concepts, better improved, more adjusted, culturally feasible uh, concepts that we are implementing. And on the other side, people perceive and build, um, we're building a feeling of trust and ownership as people are part of the process. Of course, they perceive it more as theirs. So they are more willing to say like, hey, let's try this. You know, we made this decision together. We've defined where it is. We defined, you know, we were part of how the truck should look like. So, so it feels also more comfortable then to to collaborate with those different elements of the service, from the toilet to the collection to, um, yeah, later the the reuse. So I think there it just takes a lot of time. And for us, it took quite, uh, yeah, I would say those those years since 2000, 2018 until now. And now we are we are strategizing on how to systematize all of those different strategies that we're using in the community. How can we systematize it to not repeat this process in every community? Of course, we need to optimize all those community interventions, the different workshops we have done, the different stakeholder um, uh, uh, processes we have gone through uh, with the municip municipality with the health centers that are in the community, with community leaders. So how can we systematize that to speed that up in our scaling process and more communities? It is a challenge. There's no, no, there's no, I won't um, uh, 
uh, not say that, of course, it's a challenge. But I think if you are willing to take the time and spend money on those processes to have someone who only focuses on that, who is from the community, who speaks the local language, um, to hire even more people, I think it is possible to integrate. I mean, for us, it is possible to integrate such a novel approach in a quite traditional indigenous community. And I think we have maybe not consciously chosen, but one of the we find ourselves in one of the most complex cultural setups there in Guatemala because the communities are still quite traditional. I mean, there's a there's a queen elected every year and there is indigenous leaders who are um, active in parallel to officially elected leaders, which have sometimes more decision power than the official mayor of the community. So we have to collaborate with both with community elders, uh, community leaders, indigenous leaders, and the official mayor. So it is culturally quite complex. And I think that's why it also took us four years to build, to develop our technology, to develop this social approach, to find the right partners, to hire the right people from the community, to collaborate with them, to come up with a system that now allows us to speed up this scaling process. Thank you, Mona. Thank you. We have... Just Can one I more. Just add one, one last additional comment. You know, um, it's very important because we are we are we are ending up with the time. How do we continue the discussion and where are what are formats? I'm more than happy to to replicate in other uh, platforms or in other opportunities. But this needs the important part is what we're doing right now, right? We are, quite, we, are, we are an exchange, we're discussing, and we try to, to, to see. The biggest resource we have for all of that is not money, it's not carbon, it's trust among those people who will make it happen or lose trust, which uh, most of you guys have been coming along. But I, this is what I'm hearing from Mona, and let's see how we make that flow again to construct that sector. Go ahead, <laughs> Michaela, sorry for interrupting. No worries, thank you, Stefan. Um, I was just gonna say we have one more question and a one more comment. If the participants, if you'd like to stay for a few minutes longer, you, you can, but if you have to go, of course, thank you for joining us um, and we hope to see you at the next webinar. But let me just ask this question. Um, we have a question from Teddy Gounden, who says, what's, what, what's the level of collaboration with other CBS providers and their value chain solutions? Um, I think this one is more broader. So maybe if any of you have anything to say about this. Why don't we let somebody from the CBS Alliance speak and take the microphone? I think, or Remy, or who else Remy would think that? Yes. Remy, okay. take the mic. Okay, okay, let me, let me, Remy, please, if you feel comfortable, turn your video on, yes? Yeah, hello. However, I was actually writing a message and I, I wasn't actually listening to the question, I'm sorry. So can you repeat that? Of course, no worries. So Teddy Gounden asks, what's the level of collaboration with other CBS providers and their value chain solutions? Okay, yeah. Okay, so it was Teddy's question. Um, well, Teddy, we're going to talk tomorrow about that. Um, but um, uh, yeah, a lot of the CBS providers started their operations about you know, 10, 12 years ago and came together six years ago to form an alliance because they had the same challenges operationally for advocacy, for finance, et cetera. So the, the CBS alliance has been created primarily as a way of exchanging. And there's quite a lot happening uh, through regular um, you know, presentations and exchanging of technologies and, and so on. I mean, they all operate in different contexts, but there's still quite a lot of similarities. Um, and this is the basis now for the Alliance doing lots more uh, advocacy work to make sure that CBS is embedded in, well, international and national policies. So seeing it in landmark publications like the Compendium is of, of course absolutely great. It's been there for a while, but now I think it's, it, it's more representative of how it's actually used in practice as a whole chain. Um, yeah. It's in the, WHO guidelines and citation on the, in the JMP, but the biggest stumbling block will be in national policies and on municipal plans, and they, this will be the proof that they can work. So we're exchanging a lot of the moments on this as well, on how that uh, how that can happen, and that also comes from the experience of the CBS providers who have done more work with authorities, with uh, or with uh, with with funders to see what kind of advocacy messages work, what kind of um, 
uh, of work with with municipal planners, etc., leads to results. But yeah, happy to chat more about that, but we're over time, so I won't expand more. Thank you so much, Rami, for your contribution. Um, Mofwe, I see your question has been answered by Remy. I would encourage you to exchange contact details to, you know, just discuss more. But on that note, I would like to thank all of our lovely speakers today um, for sharing your information and experience and knowledge. Um, thank you so much to the participants from joining up, for joining us. And we hope to be with you very, very soon. Um, we will have our next FSMA Spotlights next month. Um, so look out for more news about that. Um, but yeah, I hope you have an enjoyable day or night, afternoon, wherever you are. Take care of yourselves and we'll see you very soon. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you very much for the organization.